So finally, I will prove the inversion algorithm for the radon transform that's more or less used in all computerized tomography devices. And uh, yeah, it's filtered back projection. And I'll define it using the Ries potential. And uh, let me make one short remark first. So let f uh, function in the, in the Schwartz space R of Rn. Uh, so it's rapidly decaying. And let alpha smaller than 1. Then uh, norm psi to the minus alpha is integrable at 0 because it's small, alpha is smaller at, uh, than, um, than n. Then this is integrable at 0. And it's integrable at infinity because f hat decays faster than any polynomial than one over any polynomial so um, this over here is actually is in fact in l1 and same thing let's uh, g uh, a data function so defined on sn minus one times r and let alpha smaller than one uh, then this is a one-dimensional function with respect to sigma and uh, also that's integrable for sigma at zero and for sigma at infinity. So uh, um, this is also in L1 of C. Okay, so uh, we can take the inverse Fourier transform of uh, these functions and we find that, uh, and we define the functions um, I alpha, that's the Ries potential on the Schwartz space of Rn. Uh, and it gives a function in the Schwartz space of Rn. And it, what it simply does is it multiplies with norm psi of minus alpha in the Fourier domain. So uh, to compute I alpha f, I have to compute the Fourier transform of f, multiply with or divide by norm psi over alpha uh, in the Fourier domain and take the inverse Fourier transform. Okay, so we have the property that I alpha F hat, Fourier transform of that is norm psi minus alpha F hat. Same thing for data functions, but this time, of course, as usual, only with respect to the second variable. So in this case, we define I alpha F G actually. hat with respect to the second variable. Uh, e alpha f hat as um, of theta, theta and sigma as sigma to the minus alpha g hat of theta and sigma. And all that is defined. So uh, that's OK. Uh, I alpha is called the Ries potential. And you immediately see what it finally does. For example, for it does exactly what we proposed for the row filtered layer gram. We take the Fourier transform, we uh, multiply with uh, some monomial in uh, Fourier space, we take the inverse Fourier transform. That's exactly what we proposed for row filtered layer gram. So it does exactly that. So we will assume that it really, um, in a way, it um, inverts the Raylon transform. Okay, so uh, main theorem, actually main theorem of today, that uh, um, alpha be any number with uh, that is larger or equal to zero and smaller than n. Then we have that uh, the uh, that any Im a function in image space. So write that down for f a function in image space, we have that f can be recovered from the measured data rf by that formula. So uh, this is the measured data. We apply i to the alpha minus n plus 1. So we take the Fourier transform, divide by alpha minus n plus 1, and take the inverse Fourier transform. Then we take the back projection, and uh, then we um, uh, we take the Fourier transform again, uh, divide, uh, multiply this time with a norm c to the alpha, and up to a factor. What we receive is f. Now, um, 
let's quickly interpret that. Uh, for example, let's take alpha as n minus one. Then this one over here uh, goes away. So this is nothing but the back projection of the data Rf. And uh, what we have to do to invert it is take the Fourier transform, multiply with norm psi to the alpha, take the inverse Fourier transform. That's exactly what we are already defined as rho filtered layer wrap. Uh, let's take alpha equal to zero. Then uh, we have no, um, uh, we don't have to do anything in, um, in image space. That's nice. All we have to do is now in, um, in data space. So we have to take these, uh, the Fourier transform of RF with respect to the second variable. Uh, this time, um, multiply uh, in the Fourier domain with um, sigma, absolute value of sigma to the one minus n, take the inverse Fourier transform and the data that comes out of that, take the Fourier, uh, take the um, back projection of that and you immediately get your function back again up to some constant. Okay, so we have two algorithms. Uh, one is taking is uh, is uh, taking the um, back projection of the data without doing anything on them, and then does some filtering in image space. And the second algorithm does exactly the opposite. It uh, takes the data, applies some filter to it, and then uh, back projects that data and. Uh, um, if you look at the effort, at the cost of that, then it turns out that the second algorithm is a little bit nicer. It's a bit, little bit cheaper. And uh, that's why this one is preferred. And in fact, the second one, I think I didn't say the name yet, filtered back projection is the working horse of computerized tomography. So that's what, what's used everywhere. Okay, so uh, let's prove that. Let me first remark that uh, e to the minus alpha uh, applied to e to the alpha is f. Why is that the case? Now, if you take f, then uh, norm, this is um, uh, multiplied. Um, what it does is it multiplies by one over norm psi uh, to the alpha and um, in Fourier space. And this one multiplies with norm psi of alpha in the Fourier space. Now that cancels. So uh, and this, this formula is correct. Okay, so uh, now let's start with uh, the, um, the Reese potential at some point x. Now that makes sense. F uh, is now um, a function in image space. Now uh, the uh, filtered version that we got from Reese potential is again uh, in image space. So it makes sense to evaluate that in image space. This is an image. Okay, um, to be able to include the definition of the Reese potential, I write it as I alpha F. Fourier transform, inverse Fourier transform evaluated at some point x. Now I write down, now I write down the definition, the definition of the inverse Fourier transform. So that's uh, the um, two pi over minus two, two pi to the minus n over two. Uh, integral over Rn. Um, yeah, integral over uh, Rn, and then we have I alpha hat, and then now I can plug in the definition of the um, uh, of the Ries potential. So that's norm xi to the minus alpha f hat of xi e to the i x xi d xi. So this comes from the inverse Fourier transform, of course. Okay. Um, now write me. Let's uh, let me write this in uh, polar coordinates. So we write it as the integral over S n minus one integral over R plus. We still have two pi to the minus n over two, and uh, now we get an additional integration constant of uh, sigma to the n minus one. So uh, this now becomes sigma to the n minus one minus alpha. We have f hat now of sigma times theta polar coordinates, we set uh, xi as sigma times theta, e to the x 
theta uh, now uh, xi is now sigma times theta, so we can write it as this over here, and of course it's d sigma d theta. Okay, why did we do this? Uh, well, now we have f hat of sigma times theta, so we can plug in uh, the Fourier slice theorem here, and uh, first of all, we now get um, a constant from, from by going from f well the f hat becomes r f hat here of course so f hat of sigma times theta becomes r f uh, hat of theta and sigma and we get that constant over here of minus n minus one over two okay um now uh, we still have the integral over sn minus one. We still have the integral over r plus. Sigma is positive, so I can replace just replace this with the absolute value of sigma. That doesn't change anything, and uh, nothing else changed. Okay. Now um, let me observe what happens if we let sigma go to minus sigma and theta to minus theta. Okay, if we do that, then uh, the integral over here, the limits of that integral don't change. If I take for, for theta. Now, um, the integral over sigma, um, if I let sigma go to minus sigma, then this is now an integral over minus r plus or r minus, okay? Sigma absolute value doesn't change. Um, now here we have an, oh, excuse, uh, um yeah we ah i uh, just we had that rf doesn't change uh, when we let uh, uh, <laughs> we had that rf doesn't change when we take the negative of both the arguments so we have uh, rf of theta and sigma is the same of uh, as rf of minus theta and minus sigma uh, you immediately see that uh, this is also the case for the Fourier transform. I didn't prove this here, I just realized. But it's also true that RF of theta and sigma is the same as RF hat of minus theta and minus sigma. Just write down the definition of the Fourier transform and it's there. Okay, so this one doesn't change as well. And uh, what about the exponential over here when we let sigma go to minus theta, theta to minus theta? It doesn't change. It also doesn't change. So nothing in this integral over here changes if we go from sigma to uh, minus sigma or from theta to minus theta, except for the integration over here. This one bec becomes r minus. And what about the integration constant where we go from theta, sigma to minus sigma, theta to minus theta, integration constant is one. So um, uh, if we go from, if we take the integral over here as the integral over r minus, then simply nothing changed. Nothing changes. It's exactly the same. Now, this means that the integral which we have over here is the same as one half the integral over r plus plus the integral over r minus for this one over here. Okay, so that means it's one half the integral over all of r, um, see, uh, integral over sn minus one, integral over over r, all of <laughs> the real numbers, and this integral over here. So. We're just filling up the missing part here of, uh, of R minus. Okay, so um, this is the same as one half, two pi to the, let, let me now write, write this down, this is n minus one half, integral over s n minus one, integral, now this becomes integral over R, absolute value of sigma to the n minus one minus alpha, R f hat of theta and sigma, e to the i sigma, x times theta d sigma d theta. Just using what I just proved, the integral over r plus is one half the integral over all of r. Okay, now let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Uh, the sigma absolute value of sigma to the n minus one minus alpha r f hat of theta and sigma, that's exactly the definition that we just had. So this is, uh, I to the minus n plus R one plus alpha Rf of theta and sigma. It's exactly the definition of the least potential. Now look what we have here. Uh, this is integral over R, this function over here, times e to the i sigma x times theta. 
Okay, this is the inverse Fourier transform of this function with respect to the second variable evaluated at x times theta. So the, but the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform is the function itself. So this integral over here is nothing but i to the minus n plus one plus alpha data function Rf evaluated at theta and x times theta. And now look what is left. The integral over Sn minus one, this function evaluated as at theta times, uh, at theta and x, x times theta, d theta, that's the back projection. And it's the back projection of this function. So finally, we have that I alpha f of x is the same as this function. And now we're done because uh, according to what I already remarked, I can now apply i to the minus alpha to both sides. And uh, what comes out is exactly what I claimed. Okay, so um, we, get, we now get a zoo of uh, reconstruction algorithms for each alpha between uh, zero and n. Uh, but actually, the two that really make sense uh, are really the, the both that uh, I, uh, I already wrote down. So the special case is alpha equals to zero and alpha equals to n minus one. If we choose something in between, then uh, we find that we'll have to do convolution, that we'll have to perform um, a risk potential twice, which would be far too costly and uh, it doesn't really give you any benefit. Okay, so uh, that was it for today. And it's clear what we'll start with next time. We'll discuss the both algorithms that we now have proved and at hand.